I introduce you to Simeon Ganev from Krakow. And he will tell us something about composition and the title of the panel is Composition Do's and Don'ts. Let's start. Thanks. Welcome everybody. First, I will make a short introduction who I am and what exactly I do. But uh, I have to run through all these pictures because composition is a very, uh, is a very big topic. You cannot, of course, uh, say everything in 45 minutes. And uh, this topic is uh, very much like uh, politics. Everybody has his own opinion. And it's a discussion about composition since years and years. Maybe uh, after modern times, in the 20th century, they came such uh, new ideas. And now, if somebody says, I'm following these rules, so another artist will say, I follow completely other rules, and your composition theory is crap, but mine is the best. So there is a very big discussion about this, what exactly is the best way to compose a painting. And um, there is no golden answer for it, there is no perfect answer for it, but there are just some uh, things that we can say what looks mostly bad and what looks mostly good. Not always, but mostly. So very often things, uh, some errors are repeated and some uh, very good decisions are also repeated. And then we can say just by observation of the people of the, who play or just uh, uh, not exactly if only if they look at the picture, but normal painting, not, a, not in, a, in a game. So only by observation of the reaction of the people we can say that they are some things that usually the artists do good and some things they do wrong. And this is what I, what I want to talk about uh, today. It's just some steps in a big lava of uh, theories about compositions. And I'm going to just jump on some of these stones in this lava field and say what people discovered that there are good decisions and bad decisions. But shortly, just what I do. Uh, I have two jobs now. I work uh, since uh, three years as a teacher, drawing teacher, classic drawing, pencil, uh, in a private university in Krakow, Tishna European University. And I also teach their illustration. And now we start in September, the bright new thing, digital art uh, at this university. So it's something completely new, but that's another story. And my second job, I'm still freelancing, and I'm doing hidden object puzzle, puzzle adventure games, and I do only this. I was only, always interested just in this kind of games, because I'm an educated architect, so uh, for me, this kind of games, the hidden object games, are the perfect dream of an architect who doesn't want to build houses exactly and enter into the building business, because he can build worlds uh, without an end, without an any kind of restrictions just from uh, his imaginations. So designing a location, a space, uh, it is an open space or a closed an interior, it's one of the best things what uh, an architect can think for himself if he wants to go to uh, game dev and be an artist. So I'm working on hidden object games since six years. Before I was uh, 13 years uh, in advertising. But uh, I left this job in 2008 after 13 years and I went into uh, game dev and I'm still only in hidden object games. I worked in Artifex Mundi, I have to say that, because it's a great company and they are my teachers in, in the beginning. But then I started to work on my own projects and now I'm my latest project, which I'm going to show you at the end of this presentation, some pictures of it. I know that everybody is waiting for the colorful, nice pictures, but I cannot show it on the beginning because you're going to leave. So I have to show it on the end and first show you some simple pictures, which explain how I came to this final uh, colorful uh, locations. So I'm working now since three years uh, on a project, which is on Facebook. It's, called, it's a hidden object game on Facebook. Uh, which is like a TV series. Every two weeks, there is a new episode. 
So every two weeks, uh, we make four locations. It's a one mission. One mission of this game is in four locations. And we publish it on Facebook. It runs since three years, so we have now something like 150 locations done. If somebody wants to start from the beginning, because you can, you can always, a new player starts from the beginning. But, uh, well, I'm not sure exactly about numbers here, but uh, the, the, player, uh, the players are a huge number now, because this is uh, internationally and they all play uh, through, through Facebook. It's a very simplified uh, hidden object game. It doesn't have animations because of the limitations of Facebook and the limitations of time that we have to make a mission only two weeks. So we work like two, three designers, depends, and we have to make uh, one mission in four weeks, in two weeks time. So there is no animations, there is just simple plain picture with uh, picking objects on it, like in hidden object. And some kind of story, simple story, because it has to be simple, but very universal story, so we can keep all this series for years if the players are going to be satisfied. So the strongest point in this simple game is exactly the, how nice the scenes are. Because this is one of the most important things in hidden object games. The scene has to be very pleasant, very well made, with big de detail, with uh, beautiful lights and colors, because this keeps the player. It's, it's a static scene, it doesn't move, so this keeps the player uh, interested. So that's why one of the fundamental works when I start to build a scene, it's the composition. That's what I want to talk today about. And now we start with very, very simple things, which I can describe as uh, don't, okay? Or maybe some advices what you better not do but go in the other way. They are, they are talking from this book, which I highly recommend. I also will recommend other books at the end of the presentations. Uh, this is a very thick book uh, from Giovanni Civardi. It's a universal about uh, drawing. Uh, and he has a couple of ideas of, uh, from composition, what to do and what not to do. So, for some of you, this is going to be very simple and you already know about it. So, I'm going to like, make it faster. Uh, first of all, what uh, a lot of artists say uh, uh, as an advice, just uh, go away from symmetry. This is, of course, discussionable. It's a discussion about this, stay with symmetry or go away. But mostly, in most situations, exactly in this, what I do in the hidden object uh, games, you go away from symmetry. So, don't do anything, anything symmetrical, go rather this way. If we can see on the simple diagram to remember, don't put something in the middle uh, of a picture. Okay, this is obvious, looks obvious, simple. But uh, let's go uh, further. Now, dividing the picture in two halves, into equal halves. This is also kind of, it looks very simple and obvious that don't do it, all right? Don't put your horizon in the middle exactly of the picture. Don't divide the picture like this, that you have a sea down there and a sky on the uh, above, so uh, it looks like the Polish flag. But um, it's kind of boring. So put your horizon either below or above uh, the middle of the picture. Now, don't divide the, the picture in two equal parts in contrast. This can be understood as black, white, or uh, full, or empty. And always try to uh, escape from this, from this uh, equality, because this is, as again, going into some kind of symmetry. And the, what, we, what we're going to see that uh, all the artists here are trying to go away from symmetry mostly and to go to asymmetrical decisions. But then comes the difficulty. When such an asymmetrical decision and asymmetrical composition looks pleasant because the solutions are millions for asymmetrical compositions. So that's why they just said, okay, first try not to do it uh, like this, and then we will see what we can do after. Maybe put another object which, uh, which will destroy this symmetry and the uh, exact weight uh, balance here. 
We'll see, maybe. This is one of the, one of the escape plans from, uh, from these situations. Now, the very common thing, a fuse edges, like this. This is uh, everywhere. Uh, you can see this uh, mistake in very often in the works of my students too in the first year of, uh, of, their, of their work. But not only in uh, art for, uh, for the game dev, you can see these mistakes in graphic art, for, uh, um, uh, in advertising, in any kind of graphic design. Uh, very often you will see exactly this mistake. So we are the lack of air. We don't have an air around this object from above. So there are two solutions here. Only one is pictured. Let him breathe above or just crop it, which is not presented here. But don't leave it like this. And this mistake is uh, common and it's repeatedly, you will see in different situations, uh, uh, it comes out exactly this, uh, this thing. The fused edges. Again, mm, coming back to the symmetry, don't go to symmetry. No? Symmetry always will be boring. This is a lot of uh, artists say, Loomis says the same, Andrew Loomis, uh, another great teacher in drawing. Uh, Civardi says this, uh, very often people will say, don't go into symmetry. Just destroy it with different weight of this, of this object. The more variable the objects, the better. Not the same ones, one uh, to another. Even if we say that this can be composition made by some rules, like the rule of thirds, for example, because we're gonna talk about it, about the rule of thirds, even then, this still will be boring. And now if you have too much horizontal lines, this is also boring because everything here is about escaping from boredom. If the player keeps seeing these pictures on and on and on after hours, finally he gets bored. So the idea of good composition actually is to keep him all the time uh, interested in this what, ha what is happening on the pictures. So not him to get bored. And that's why exactly here is the word monotony. If you have all the time horizontal lines, and even if you have here aerial perspective trick, so everything goes more and more blue and transparent if, if, when it goes far away, even then it's better to break it somehow with some vertical lines, with some object here, here maybe near, completely near, maybe on the second plane, on the next level, the next layer, but if you can break it, it will be always better for uh, composition to go away from monotony. This also looks very straightforward, so the, don't draw like this or don't uh, make your projects like this, that the center of everything what happens is exactly in the middle. This is also connected with the previous, uh, previous advice not to divide the picture in half, but now we have lines which theoretically are uh, leading the eye somewhere. So you're leading the eye this way, the eye of the viewer. But it's better to lead him like this, to make a curve. It's always better to make some kind of curve, not to, to lead it just straight forward. This is boring, and uh, the human brain likes such a surprises. It likes when it gets a little bit more interesting. It likes, for example, the curve, the so-called magic curve. This is also very often uh, used in composition. If you keep the player going around and don't put it just straight forward, go to the street and there you have your award at the end. So, escape from this and go with curves. It's always better. Even I see here that uh, Giovanni Civardi a little bit made a dynamic composition by uh, escaping from the horizontal plane here. So you have a camera roll. A little bit of this, a little bit of this side, always better in the hidden object games. If you see all the locations, they are like a little bit rolled. So this makes the compositions immediately more dynamic. The whole shot is dynamic and is more interesting for the brain. People just like it better than when it's static and horizontal. I don't know if this here was a coincidence, but uh, I'm, I saw that he actually changed the, the horizontal into a little bit camera roll. This is the, the curve. That's what I was talking about. So this is uh, the, the, his last uh, uh, <coughs> advice. 
even if you have now what he drew before, you have a curve, okay, good, uh, I will, you don't go straight. But this curve immediately goes out of the picture, so it gets you out of the frame. So if you are a player, a viewer, and you go some kind of interactive on the scene, this guides you out of the scene too soon. That's the point here, it's too soon, too fast. You are out of the scene, your interest goes away. It doesn't want to, to go further. So keep him still there, keep him further, take him deeper into the, into the drawing, into the painting. Make the curve. The curve is very popular in painting. And I'm saying here not only now in interactive thinking of the game, but it's popular in painting, in classic painting. This composition of a curve, this sometimes is a road, is a river, it can be um, just a um, piece of bushes around, but uh, in, such a, in such a form, in such a shape, like a curve. So the classic painters very often use this to keep the attention inside, to take him deeper into the painting. So this was Chivari, and I hope it was too fast, so I can go to the more interesting stuff. Uh, Don'ts. Don't what not to do. Let's see now. I had some uh, some sketches here and also some quick renders. But let's start with the sketches. There are many situations that immediately show that something is wrong. Here are just a couple of examples. This is now the wrong examples. You have an antlers. So antlers. So try to avoid such situations like where you have one object and beside him comes something more, which eventually if you, you have to try to work on the first object, on the values much more, or on the second to make it aerial perspective so they're a little bit lighter to escape from these situations. But anyway, the fundamental mistake was already made. It doesn't matter now what you're going to do after, that you're going to paint it more black, the, the house more, more contrast, and keep the trees more um, out of contrast, so they, they be lighter. But this still is going to stay. So, pay attention to this, what happens to such an object. Like, for example, it's a, s a short series. Hidden edge. Yeah. One object overlaps the other, but exactly in the same place when it's the edge of the first object. So, it's better just to move it around so somewhere here in the middle, or just move it away. But don't exactly keep it on the edge. It's very, it's very bad when it exactly covers the edge of the object, because the brain of the viewer doesn't see where the house ends, and this bothers him. This is something what we really don't like. When we don't see the end of the, the shape. When you just show a little bit, and the brain cannot explain what exactly happens there. Maybe there's something interesting, and I can't see it because it's the edge. I don't know even how big is this house now. The split apex. So you have something in, in the background which exactly covers, again, unfortunately, in the same place when there's another apex. So try to look at such a moment. Sometimes it happens. You know, the, the apex of these two objects are, is split. It's almost the same. This is the bad place. The stolen edge is obvious. But this, I guess, is so obvious that everybody's going to avoid it. You know? Come on. Again, an edge is covered by another edge. So keep attention to your edges of the objects of the first layer and the second layer, and so on and so on. And now let we come to some renders and by uh, framing, cropping. Okay. So this mistake is called closed corner. So if you crop an image like this, uh, first you close, you close your corner very dramatically. And there is nothing else happens here, so that's why this is much more heavier feeling now. This is one shape and closes the corner. It begins to be very heavy to the left downside. But another thing which is important here, you are starting to lose the shape. Because the more and more this ball gets into this down uh, left corner, the less the, the, the viewer is going to figure what exactly sh uh, this shape is. And comes again this, what bothers him. He doesn't understand the shape, so he gets bothered. So he can leave the, uh, the picture. 
This is the, uh, the point when the mistake can follow to uh, boredom and leaving the game, for example. Fused edge is the same what we saw in the other uh, drawings. The object is cropped very bad, so you could just see you just touching the edge of the, of the frame of the picture. So avoid this at any cost. Fused edges of shapes, the same thing. The both, the both objects uh, are very wrongfully touched here. This, this, this is something what people uh, don't like to see very often. Everything is kind of... It has to be a, a strong decision. Either keep them separated or overlap them more, a little bit more. But don't keep them like this uh, when they just are, t uh, are touching each other. Halved shaped, okay? It's, uh, it's not in the corner and the shape is recognizable, but it's exactly in the middle, cropped. So again, mm, go away from symmetry. Symmetry is bad. So if you crop uh, a shape exactly in the middle, you are coming close to the uh, symmetry. Again, halving something. It looks n not unnatural and it has to be the cropping, the pleasant cropping, the asymmetrical cropping. Uh, of a frame or a picture, it has to look very natural. So if you make something like this, that you have the shape, this already doesn't look natural, because it's, it's too obvious that it's in the middle. And of course, the best cropping of all these situations, of this bowl, will be something like this. There are some more solutions to this, of course, but comparing with the mistakes before, this is the first uh, decision which can be said that it's not wrong. Okay, let's go to some more uh, interesting things, so more color maybe. What to do? Now the horizon and the three planes, okay, this was already said before, but just to see it as a picture. Uh, place the horizon above or below the middle. If you have a middle of the, of the frame, just the horizon, so there, is in this case above, right? And or place it be below the the middle of the picture. Just don't don't place it in the middle. That's the most important. Here is again the horizon is somewhere there, and we have the half of the picture there. So it doesn't matter what kind of picture you have. So maybe you have vertical picture, and here we have a curve which takes the player, the viewer, deeper and deeper, slowly into the uh, m important things with prob which probably happen here or here in the composition. But don't take him straight forward to that. Just keep your time. And, um, yeah, the three planes. Here uh, gets a little, bit, a little bit now more complicated, another stage. Keep at least three planes when make when you design the first drawing. So foreground, middle ground, and distance, at least. So think in layers, okay? First layer, second layer, third layer, or plane, so-called. First plane, second plane, third plane. Maybe more. The more, the better, but it, this becomes difficult. Three, it's like uh, standard, okay? It's everything's fine. You have something in the foreground, you have something in the middle ground, and something in the distance. It's okay. You can make more, but then it gets a little bit more complicated, and you have to work more on it. So four planes, five planes, this is a little bit, uh, a little bit too much. Now, overlapping a frame. Overlapping enhances the depth of field and unifies the elements of the picture. So now I'm going to show something which is basically a start, maybe such a kind of start of a hidden object scene. I, I use this um, very simple room, which I made in, in uh, 3ds Max, just to, to show some kind of uh, bad and good decisions. But um, this is already some kind of uh, basic start for some kind of hidden object scene. So we have here the overlapping of elements, which theoretically enhances the depth of field. But of course, the mistake here is that they are very badly overlapped. Uh, you ha we have the fused edges, they are just touching. So it's better to overlap them like with strong decisions. You know? Keep one away maybe, the other one comes very more, more hidden behind the first. Or like this, it's also better. 
just trying to, when overlapping, trying to get to this point that the edge, for example, which covers the third object, doesn't cover, doesn't end in the half of the third object, or a little, just goes a little bit more to the left, so it is not in the middle, it doesn't exactly uh, crops, crops him in the middle, overlaps him in the middle. The same here, the ball is not overlapped in the middle, so one third, one fourth, these are better decisions than uh, just the half. And so on, this can go and go and go and go. This is like more uh, theoretical hidden object scene when you start to put uh, interior uh, stuff into the room, like uh, furniture or other objects which are important. And then the, the whole play starts to get more and more interesting because you start to overlap objects one after another. And here is, here is a fun, for me this is a fun because you're just trying to keep this uh, that way that you overlap this right. So you don't have uh, hidden edges, you don't have fused edges, and you can go like this into very far away, like uh, here is exactly maybe two rooms, which is around 20 meters, and then the light already makes it uh, like the depth of field that you don't see much of what happens there. But still, you can think even on this object how the big object overlaps the last cylinder, exactly in what, which place. Just try not to overlap in edges. This is another situation very often made uh, in hidden object games, but also in concept art. This is the framing, of course, uh, which uh, also works like an enhance of a depth of, a depth of field. So you frame the picture with some objects, which are very close to the viewer. And that's this way, he doesn't feel alienated from the scene. Another trick which we're going to see uh, now is the reposoir. It's a French word, uh, very often used by, uh, used by concept artists and also very often used in uh, hidden object games. So basically the idea is put something very near, very near the viewer. Uh, and this is very common in concept art uh, when you have a, a complicated scene. So put something very near the viewer so you can keep him more integrated with the scene. When everything starts to happen too far away from him, and when I mean too far away, this means two meters, he's not already that much part of this scene. So keep something close to him, so he feels more like he's inside of it. All right, so let's see the reposoir. The reposoir is a French word, uh, here it is. Uh, let us see where it all started. So French uh, posters before the war. So what is the reposoir? The reposoir is everything what happens here. This tree, this house, this guy is here. Or this what we see here, the part of the wall. Uh, these trees, of course. Uh, these girls here. Uh, this, these trees and this. This is the reposoir. So you have um, some kind of maybe distance scene or middle ground and distance, and distance plane, but in the something comes out very near. Usually, it's dark because it's too close to the viewer. And uh, this is, as I said, use that's why to keep the viewer integrated with the scene, so he doesn't feel like he's flying all over the cities, for example, or for on this uh, on this scene. So he keeps more more clear, more close to it, like this, for example, typical reposoir. So this trick is very often used in concept art and very often also in hidden object games in the scenes because it gives immediately, it gives immediately uh, depth, depth and a field of belonging to the scene. Um, I have uh, these pictures from my friend here, Grzesiek Przybysz, some of you know him very well. So uh, he knows that I'm showing this uh, as a very well, well example of concept art and reposoir. This is what we have here. Of course, he has the dynamic composition here, camera roll, to keep it more interesting. It doesn't keep it horizontal. And he uses very often the reposoir. This, this here. It's in, in sense of work, it's a very good trick because it's, it doesn't take much work. Usually it's too dark. 
So maybe just the working on a silhouette like this here, or this, gives, uh, gives, uh, uh, gives uh, very much depth to the picture, and it's very fast and easy to do. So it's a very good trick. We have it here everywhere. It's so commonly used that uh, when I see, for example, yeah, the same here, this object and this object are the reposoir. How you write it? Yeah, I have this something here written. Uh, how exactly is this? Yeah, like this. Yeah, this is a French word. An object placed in the foreground of a composition that enhances the illusion of distance. James Gurney uh, writes about it in his book uh, Imaginative Realism, which I recommend. Um, so this is how he describes it. It's from the French painters. And in the end, if we look at the absolutely cold school of art and design of the Feng Zhu and the works of his students, we're going to see everywhere the uh, reposoir here, even in the, in the concept in the beginning. Sometimes it looks like it's given on the very last end. Here is okay, yeah? Uh, it looks good, but we can see it everywhere in every concept. And here too, you recognize it already, you don't have to show it, it's, it's clear what it is. <laughs> and for example, here or more on the next picture, oh, here it is, come on. It looks like he made it in the last moment. It looks like the picture was already done. And now I have to put this because Feng Su said well, I have to make it. So in every picture they put something like this because this looks really like it's out of the, not, on, not because it's out of the frame. Of course, this looks like a trick uh, intentionally if out of the frame, but it looks like it's in the water. It's not on the street already. So it's kind of weird, for example. And this too, it looks like made later. To, to make the reposoir. So, we can see now where we don't see a reposoir. Most of the Polish people know this painting. It's one of the most famous, perhaps, Polish painting, which is in Warsaw, in the National Museum. And it's huge. It's twice the, sa the size we see it here. But uh, we don't see a reposoir here. And of course, the whole battle is a little bit weird. What gives the reposoir? The reposoir gives a depth, uh, like the, a, an illusion that you are close into it. So in, if you now remember the, uh, the Witcher drawings of Grzesiek Przybysz, so you, you think you're, you're there, exactly. And here, what is the feeling that you have? If you, he shows a battle, a real very, uh, with a lot of detail, but why doesn't he have uh, nothing in front? Why, why he keeps the, the viewer like uh, away from it? If you see exactly how the picture ends, it's like cut with a knife. The battle ends here. They have an invisible line here. Behind this line there is no battle at all. Nothing happens. You're like on a, on a, in a theater. I talked with a historical, uh, art historical about it, and he agreed that uh, perhaps this is, the, this is the reason why it looks like this. Now, this is, uh, the composition of this painting is it's not very uh, like, uh, acknowledged by the critics. So it doesn't have much pla planes, like uh, distance plane, uh, middle ground. It has something here in the distance and a little bit of there. And here, everything's what happens here is like stairs. You have just the, the next people and the next and the next battle group, they are like sitting on stairs, like a little bit higher, a little bit higher. And everything begins here from a line. Okay, it looks like this was uh, made because uh, Mateiko knew only theater. Okay? And... Um, it doesn't, there were no more, there were still not movies there, which they were showing like Braveheart, the battle in Braveheart, that you see someone comes very close and you see blood on the screen, very near, so you're inside the battle. This is like a theater, like a stage. The viewer is away from the battle. And everyone is sitting like on the chairs beside to, to, to look like a... Uh, uh, there is no this, this, this real feeling, feeling in it. 
So, I have this 10 minutes left, and I have to show you the nice pictures on the end, all right? So everything comes to this. I start with a room. This is a boring room. Okay? Now maybe it's a little bit better, but not quite, because it's in the middle, exactly, the corner. This is also a bad shot. Okay, moving away. Again, this is a better shot. Now it's a little bit better. Avoiding symmetry, not in the middle. Uh, the corner of this room is not exactly in the middle. Going more like this, maybe, because usually all the objects are, that you have to pick up are on the floor, and not much happens on the, on the ceiling. So you lower the camera view down. And dynamic, so camera roll a little bit. And now what we can give more. So if we can keep the player looking somewhere in the distance and make him second plane, third plane, it will be better. So give him more and more light sources, a reposoir on in, the, in the beginning, something in the, in the front of the camera. And then maybe you can build some kind of visual story here with some objects which show him where to go. And on the end, put more and more and more for furniture. But this is how the process goes. And it ends in such scenes, basically. These are scenes from the uh, project which I do now on, on Facebook. Every location is in a different place of the world, so because this is the setting. It happens in all over the world. And it's made with different techniques. Uh, there are 3D objects, 3D scenes, and also sometimes uh, some uh, photography, photo bashing. But uh, here, for example, everything is uh, 3D, except uh, the bus here over there. Some objects, of course, are photos. But the basic composition in the front, uh, the truck, is uh, 3D. And that's how it goes in the end in different locations. That's a typical Hao scene, full of detail. But people who love playing a hidden object, they like such a scenes. They want this to, to, to be more difficult. So, I jumped uh, over uh, one part of the presentation because, as I thought, uh, there are really too much things in composition. There, are, there can be much more ideas, like if we come to modern ideas, dynamic symmetry. This is now the thing that rules everything. The rule of thirds, it's already bad. Maybe just uh, amateur photographs, beginners, you can make something with the rule of thirds. But now everything is made in dynamic symmetry. And dynamic symmetry is completely other story. It's a little bit more complicated to explain it in 45 minutes. But if I have another 45 minutes, maybe I can talk only about dynamic symmetry. And then you can see that it's not that difficult. But just to keep the, the word dynamic symmetry, Google it, find it, this is the most modern now approach to uh, composition. Okay. That's it, I guess. Okay. Now we... I bet you have a lot of questions, but let's uh, agree on five, okay? Because we just have five minutes, and so let's the battle begin. Who wants to ask a question? Okay, let's start with you. Uh, just one <coughs> quick question. Why did you say the rule of thirds is already passé? Um, if you start to Google dynamic symmetry, the, the guys who actually talk about dynamic symmetry, they're enemies of the rule of thirds. And uh, just find it on the internet. They explain it very well. Because rule of thirds is used uh, uh, to, in two simple ways. People just put one object on the one uh, site where the rule of third is, and then on the one line, and then another object on the other line, and uh, they think that's it, all right? But uh, that's not that simple. I mean this, okay? 
It's not that simple. This is boring. That's the point. Nowadays, this is considered already boring. This is the most simple solution, the first that everybody makes when he thinks about compositions. The first thing that the students are learning in schools, rule of thirds. And they have really very strong uh, beliefs and ideas against the use of rule of thirds. I don't have the time to explain you why. Just find it, when you find dynamic symmetry, the guys who explain dynamic symmetry, they explain why rule of thirds is badly used. Just uh, maybe you can uh, encourage Simon to go to after party and then you can discuss the dynamic symmetry rules. Okay, the next question. Hello, thank you for the talk first. And I guess this goes a bit beyond the field of just concept art, but when you're doing games and especially open world ones, it's really easy when you have one approach to a certain location or a scene and you align everything, you get a nice composition, but in an open world games, players can approach this location from many various ways, like 360 approach. How do you keep a good composition from many entry points or how do you have nice vista shots from everywhere in one location? I know that it, there's no simple answer to this, but do you have some approach? Uh, the point is if you're talking to a completely 3D uh, world, when yes. you can walk around? Yes. So there is no such thing like uh, steady composition in when you walk around in 3D because this is life also. Everything changes immediately. But in the hidden object games when you have a couple of exits from a room, for example, or you can be in one room when you see one room from different points in this room, this is not 3D, you just change the points of scene. Yeah. Once you're here in the corner, then you click and go to the door, then you click and you immediately are by the window, but you actually don't walk. No? So just changing of, a, of a scenes, then every scene, of course, is designed. Every scene is flat and is designed. But in 3D, there is no way to keep always pleasant composition because you just the world changes. Okay, enough? Okay, so... I First girl question. Thanks. Hello, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I'm wondering about aspect ratios. Uh, if uh, the rule of third is bad, so how about golden ratio? Dynamic symmetry, again. Okay, but uh, anything about golden ratio in uh, that lecture I can find? Yes, the golden ratio is a part of the dynamic symmetry. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Other questions? Hi. Hi. Uh, if you don't like uh, static composition, how about Wes Anderson movies? Do you think that composition in those movies is bad? No, this is the thing that I exactly didn't have time to say. I have it even prepared here. Uh, <laughs> exactly these movies. Yes, I have a special folder for these movies. And this is the, um, the idea of a, of a symmetry. No? Because uh, every, all the designers are, are saying uh, symmetry is bad, symmetry is bad. But what about Wes Anderson? No. Uh, my answer is the same. Wes Anderson does it perfectly. And, but if you study his, his also uh, symmetry uh, uh, pictures, this is not perfect symmetry. It's never perfect. Yes, there is a dividing line in the middle. Yes, there is a very, very simple uh, shot. But there is something always a little bit on the other side, moved around, and a little bit on that. It's not mirror, okay? He never makes it exact mirror. He makes it very simple symmetry, but not exact mirror. But there are also other directors which I, I wanted to recommend, I just, I just don't have the time. But uh, Greenaway movies, of course. Uh, it, it, they are very, very, very good to, to watch. Uh, yeah, the Grand Budapest Hotel, the, the Shirley Visions of Reality. Find this movie, the, uh, Edgar Hopper's paintings. Great movie with composition studies. The Drossman, the Drossman Contract. This is a Peter Greenaway's movie. The Mill and the Cross. This is all movies which explore the composition uh, shots and also symmetry in... Uh, in composition very well. So that's why I said in the beginning, there is no such thing like someone's gonna say, my composition is the best, I have the best idea now. I avoid symmetry at any cost. There is no such thing. There is, Wes Anderson is the proof that symmetry can be entertaining. You're right. 
Symmetry is okay. When intended, I always say like this, when I, when I read this, Chivardi's uh, advice, avoid symmetry, and Loomis also says avoid symmetry, I say to my students always, avoid symmetry unless it's intended. And that's the point. More questions? Maybe before uh, you think about another question, last two, uh, please remember you can vote and rate our speaker. I guess he'll get all A's because it was amazing and impressive. And then another question? No? So please, um, let's all thanks Simeon for a great performance. Thank you.